Uh, order, order. Welcome to the Standards Committee and our investigation, our inquiry into the Code of Conduct and possible changes to it and the way that we operate the, stand, the Code of Conduct. Uh, Lord Evans, it's uh, uh, excellent to have you with us today as Chair of the Committee on Standards in Public Life. Sometimes our two committees get confused um, and I've heard you say, no, I'm not Chair of the Committee on Standards and I've said, likewise, I'm not Chair of the Committee on Standards in Public Life. But I wonder whether you'd just like to start, a uh, starter for 10 with, um, how would you characterise the state of standards in public life in the UK today? I think it's important to recognise that there's never been a golden age of standards. I think if you look back over you know, decades, uh, there have been a series of, of issues that have raised public concern, and you only need to think about things like cash for questions, which was obviously the origin of my own committee, uh, the question of MPs' expenses, etc. But what I think is uh, definitely the case is that over the last few months, there has been a lot of public concern about standards issues. Uh, particularly sparked uh, by the Owen Paterson affair, uh, issues around um, the redecoration of Downing Street uh, and then more recently Partygate. Um, what I think is quite difficult to find evidence is whether this shows a, a sort of continuing decline of standards or more interest in it politically or to do with the fact that perhaps some of the issues which were previously hidden are now more visible. Nevertheless, one way or another, I think the, the lesson that I would take from the last six months is that uh, if ministers and others in public life are careful and think ahead around the potential implications of not maintaining very carefully high public standards, then there can be a political price to pay, and that therefore part of the role that my committee has is to try to identify those measures that would help to ensure that high standards are maintained and that political confidence is also maintained in, uh, in everybody in public life. Do voters care about it, do you think? I think undoubtedly they care about it when it's drawn to their attention. It's obviously not the only thing that they care about. Uh, so, you know, from time to time it becomes the issue of the, you know, the, in the media a very prominent issue. And I think, you know, I would conclude from the, the, both the polling and also the kind of media coverage over the last six months that people do care about it and they do expect those people who are representing them or are paid from the public purse to be maintaining high standards and to put the interests of the public first rather than their own uh, personal or political interests. Just one final one from me. Do you think there's a danger if people make the argument that voters don't care about this kind of stuff, that that's, that ends up being an excuse for bad behaviour? I think it would be. I don't think all that many people would make that case uh, in, a, in an explicit way. But what I think is very clear is that, uh, and we can see I think over the last few months, that there can be a significant political price to pay if the public don't believe that their representatives or those who are being paid from the public purse are acting in the best interest of the public. Okay. Thank you. Aaron. Thank you. Good morning, Lord Evans. Morning. Um, I'm going to focus on the respect concept. Um, as you know, the, this committee is exploring a bespoke set of principles, and you've probably heard this, this before, um, to reflect the Dolan principles. Um, and as you know also, we're developing a, a sort of a quasi-eighth principle, like at anti-racism, uh, inclusion and diversity. But your committee is having a slightly different sort of focus on that. Um, could you expand on that thinking? And also, given what's been happening over the last couple of days in terms of discussions around Islamophobia, etc., do you think that perhaps this is a great opportunity to be very specific about these issues in terms of not an eighth principle, but getting respect in those concepts on a written page? Um, as, you, as you say, we, we, we've had correspondence with your committee on this issue. Uh, if you look back, I mean, Lord Nolan himself recognised that the seven principles that he, are, he enunciated are necessary but not sufficient in terms of guiding the way in which people should behave in public life. Uh, and we very strongly support the idea that although the seven principles we believe remain very central and important for standards issues right across you know, the public realm, that those need to be interpreted for particular institutions and particular organisations. Uh, and from that point of view, you know, different organisations would want to emphasise different aspects of the standards or to draw out other elements that are important for them. We see this, for instance, with the Civil Service Code, which does not 
basically, I mean, it's broadly based or in the same sort of direction as the seven principles, but it identifies specific priorities uh, and principles that are relevant to uh, the civil service. So uh, we have absolutely no problem at all with the, the principles being interpreted for a particular environment. Uh, we have talked actually about whether the, the question of um, what, what can be called respect, the way in which people behave towards each other, should be uh, incorporated as a separate principle in, in the seven principles. Um, we, we didn't go in that direction for two reasons. Firstly, because the, the fact that the seven principles have been articulated and have been stable for 25, 30 years actually, I think, has a very positive um, impact. Uh, and I think they have real reach across not just central government, but much more widely. And I can remember when I became a, a school governor for a local state school, one of the things that's required is to, you know, to read the seven principles and say that you've read them and that you will do your public duty in accordance with them. And I think that's, that's great that you've got something that not just uh, applies to central government, but also to you know, local volunteers in, you know, in, in sort of uh, uh, areas a long way away from central London. Um, but we do think, and if you look at all the concerns about bullying and harassment and, uh, and so on, that the public are concerned about this issue. And uh, in the end, we thought we should reflect that by a change in the definition of the leadership uh, principle. Uh, but obviously your committee has taken the view that you would like to have a separately identified uh, respect principle. Uh, we haven't got a problem with that. Um, and, you know, I think it's entirely consistent with the, our thinking. It's just that we've come to a very slightly different conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Bernard. Um, I slightly bridled. I mean, I'm very sympathetic to the idea of entrenching some kind of uh, um, principle that respects diversity and emphasizes anti-racism. But I slightly bridle at the word respect. Um, what overtones do you feel the word respect now has in our culture? Um, I, I think I understand the... Um, the fact that respect can sometimes be used in a, in a sort of more political way uh, than a behavioural way, uh, and from that point of view it, it may, may have overtones. The question is what is the best uh, alternative wording? Uh, and we, we kick this around quite a lot, uh, and we, we ended up by thinking that uh, for the leadership definition, uh, respect was probably uh, as good as we could find but we, were, we are conscious that you don't want to inadvertently draw in a, a sort of set of political um, uh, assumptions about what that might mean, rather than what it might mean to the man in the, or the woman in the street. So, so you regard that the, the principle of respect is included in the leadership descriptor? Or right. That is how um, we... That's what, about, we what about adding the word mutual? Mutual respect makes it a much more dam uh, balanced in my view, a much more balanced concept, rather than somebody saying, you fail to respect me or my views or, or my phobias or my principles or my beliefs, and, um, and therefore I feel bullied and disrespected. I understand that. The, I suppose the counter-argument would be that it would rather imply that if you won't respect me, then I won't respect you. And I think given that the, the general application of the principles is meant to be a personal responsibility, people should take it upon themselves to act in a respectful way. doesn't mean you can't have strong disagreements or point out where you think somebody has got something wrong. Uh, but that if, if it is taken to imply, and I'm, not, I'm sure it's not intended to imply, that I only have to respect you if you respect me first, then I think that would be a slight concern. Uh, but I, I can see the sentiment, and I absolutely accept that the danger of any of these things, and including actually you know, any of the principles, is that they become weaponized for uh, and, and are used as a, as, a, as a weapon rather than as a, uh, an ethical principle. You're carrying on. Yep. I'm carrying on, aren't I? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was so carried away. Um, Sorry, Chris, can I just ask one Yes, sure. Go on, Michael. Um, good morning. Good morning. Um, how, how would you respond to the assertion that by incorporating the concept and principles behind respect into the leadership, what you're actually doing is, one, missing an opportunity 
by not having it front and centre, but secondly and more importantly, diluting the impact that it might have because you're folding it into something else rather than having as a separate principle on its own, which makes it very clear that certain behaviours are unacceptable. Yeah. Um, I, I can understand why somebody might say that. Uh, all these things are a balance of the different aspects, and, and there was quite a strong view on, on the committee that the fact that the seven principles have been uh, well established for a number of years, the fact that they do have a degree of recognition right across the public service, which takes time and is not easily uh, achieved, uh, meant that uh, there was a downside to saying, well, you know, we've had, to, we've had these principles well established 25 years and we're going to change them. Um, but I, I, we could, you know, there would be an argument for saying that we should have a separate one or that we should say, well, we're going to slightly re-articulate, re we will have seven principles and one will include some of these more behavioural ones. And in one sense, I would have a degree of sympathy with that. Uh, particularly, you know, we have noted over the last two or three years and indeed, indeed reflected in some of the reports that we've done, our local government report, for instance, the, uh, the, the considerable engagement we've had with, with Parliament, both in the Commons and the Lords, on uh, bullying and harassment, uh, that this at the moment is an area where public expectations are, are high. Uh, and, you know, it may be that that is a change in the, in the sort of political and social climate since the 1990s when, you know, that probably wasn't perhaps uh, the same set of expectations. So I'm, I'm, I have absolutely no objection at all to the, uh, those behavioural aspects being reflected as a specific principle. Um, it's just that our, our judgment was that we needed to reflect them, but they could perhaps best be reflected without throwing all the seven principles up and starting over. So I can, I can understand the route that you have gone on this. Okay. Bernard. <coughs> okay. Um, in your letter to us just before this session, um, you explain you've come to the view that um, MPs should no longer play a role in adjudicating breaches of the Code of Conduct. And um, um, I can tell you that um, a lot of MPs will find this very threatening and um, uh, disturbing. Um, why have you reached that view? I think that in terms of the public credibility of uh, disciplinary processes, if you want to put it in those terms, I think the, the general sort of direction of travel in recent years has been towards more independence. So, you know, 40 years ago, many of the professions would have looked at their professional body to regulate them. I think increasingly that has proved not to be as effective as there has been a public appetite for. So uh, accountancy is, is, you know, has a separate regulator now, uh, and, and that's true of many of the other professions. Uh, I think there is a scepticism as to whether sitting as a... Uh, as adjudicating on the behaviour of your friends and close associates is credible, uh, and therefore, uh, and, and indeed, you know, it's interesting that the House of Lords has gone away from that procedure and has adopted a more uh, independent model for um, conduct issues in the House of Lords. Um, so our view was that in terms of the effectiveness and credibility of the system, less direct involvement of peers, uh, of, uh, when I say peers, I mean in the other sense, uh, less direct involvement of MPs in judging each other would have greater credibility, but I also, we also are aware that there is an issue of sovereignty, and you know, our view is that you can design a model which is still within the control and designed by Parliament and by the Commons for itself uh, without uh, having to sit to make uh, to debate and then to make uh, decisions on individual cases, and the Lords have done that. Uh, it still would be within the gift of the Lords to change their procedures if they didn't believe that was working. So we don't believe it triggers any constitutional concerns, but we do believe it would command much greater uh, public consent. Um. How would you ensure that um, an, a, an entirely independent panel, presumably of m more like the IEP uh, and more judicial in character, um, would actually take account of um, the difficulties that MPs do have managing conflicts of interest 
and understanding how would you make sure that that panel was properly informed about what it's like being an MP. I mean, this is different from bullying and harassment because that's just a matter of personal behaviour. Um, because this is about the interaction of private interests with your role as an MP, which is a very difficult thing to understand and to navigate, and we fret about it all the time. How would you make sure that that panel was properly informed before it made a decision? I think the, uh, one of the roles of this committee would continue to be to effectively be the regulator of the system, not, to, not quite so much necessarily to sit on individual cases, but to ensure that the system as a whole continued to meet the needs of MPs and of the, the House collectively. So we, are, uh, we entirely support the continuing role of a committee of this sort to ensure that the system is working. And I would imagine that an, any body, collective body, that was going to be involved in these sort of cases would wish to keep themselves uh, briefed and to continue to have dialogue in the same way that you know, the judiciary speak to businesses and other parts of government to make sure, not in the co context of any individual case, but to understand the dynamics within the industry or the business or the part of public life that they are working in. But, um, uh, that's very different from, say, having a member of parliament or an ex-member of parliament or two ex-members of parliament on a, on a body like that who may not even have voting rights or maybe even a minority, but nevertheless are in the room when things are being discussed and saying, no, 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 that's not right, you haven't understood that properly. That happens quite a lot in this committee. Um, and the lay members that join the committee, they can speak for themselves. Um, um, I feel that they, they have their eyes opened when they arrive in this committee, and um, they contribute um, very positively to this committee, but they start from a position very often of careful, astonishment. Careful, Bernard. <laughs> astonishment about certain things um, <clears throat> in the way that Parliament actually works. Well, I, I, I mean, I think you make a very good point, and, you know, th that is certainly sometimes the dynamic in, in the committee that I chair, where we are a mixture of independent members and active politicians uh, and parliamentarians, and, and it is, that's one of the strengths, I think, certainly from my point of view as a chair, that, you know, you will, you will go into a discussion thinking, well, we ought to do it like this, and then, you know, MPs will say, well, it doesn't quite work like that. Uh, and you need to consider the following. We are always very careful, incidentally, and, the, in, in, uh, and on, for instance, the, uh, the uh, recommendations that we've made to this committee, that it is not the active politicians who make those decisions and they recuse themselves from, uh, from it, but they certainly take part in the conversation so that we are aware of the complexity of some of the issues. So it may, you know, I can see that there might be a benefit in having a lay figure who has that sort of expertise to inform the consideration of an independent panel if that is the direction of travel that you decide to go in. Okay. Can I just check something? Just, yeah. not, not, not that we're going to take umbrage, but um, this isn't your offering criticism of the way this committee's operated in the individual cases. Actually, aren't we? <laughs> No, it's not. I have no criticism of the operation of this committee. I am merely, hopefully, uh, in a positive way, trying to offer suggestions from the reflection that our committee has had about ways in which the system could be further developed in the light of you know, experience and some of and the more recent cases. Just wanted to check. <laughs> Andy. I mean, that actually was the question I was going to ask. So Sorry. I, I, thank you for, for asking it so well. Um, I just want to pick up on the point you, you touched there around sovereignty. And, and um, you referred to the role of the Lords and you referred to uh, professional bodies looking at accountancy. Lords, of course, um, still producing reports on members of Parliament are elected yes. by their constituents. And... I'm, I, 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 I quite understand um, the, the concerns that, that your committee may have, but I just wonder how you would respond to the suggestion that a, an unelected group of people are effectively uh, making a decision over whether a member of parliament continues to represent uh, the, 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 that constituency. Um, surely that shouldn't be the case and that parliament should be sovereign. I think so. I think the sovereignty of Parliament is very important. What I was saying was that I don't think that by uh, 
introducing a strong independent element into the adjudication of the code, that that undermines the sovereignty of Parliament. And I think if you look at the procedures that are already in place, for instance, through the IEP, uh, com the Commons have been happy to, uh, or at least you know, willing to, uh, enable independent adjudication of those cases uh, and have not viewed that as being a, a breach of the sovereignty of Parliament. Uh, it retains, uh, Parliament would retain the ability to change the system if it felt that it wasn't operating to its satisfaction, uh, but it does enable the Commons to make, to, make, to put in place procedures which ensure that the Commons as a corporate entity, as a body, maintains public confidence. And of course the, the, the procedure in place for a recall uh, recognises absolutely that it's a matter for constituents who they elect as their MP and not for unelected uh, officials. Can I just check? So, sorry, Lord Evans. I was, I was slightly taken aback when you said that the Lords had changed its system so that the Lords were no longer adjudicating on their own. I, I thought the Lords Conduct Committee still exists and still produces reports on the conduct of members, and that's chaired now, I think, by Baroness um, Manning and Buller, isn't it? It, it is, and it, is, it does, but the, when cases are then presented to the Lords, the, there is not a debate, right. and it moves directly to uh, vote. Uh, so it as is, we do with IEP cases. Yeah, so it's yeah. closer to the process for IEP cases. As a result, I think, of disquiet in the, in the Lords about a previous case uh, mm -hmm. where it was case. debated mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and then had to be re remitted for a second time by the committee for, before it was passed. And I, th I think that people felt that that was detrimental to the, uh, the reputation of the House and that therefore yeah. they went for a, a, a process much closer to the IEP process. Um, I think the GMC, the General Medical Council, also has six registrant members and six lay members, which might be a bit more like our committee, I guess. But anyway, I, I, Aaron, uh, no, I, I'm going to go on to Alberta, if that's all right. I've got a supplementary, but it'll tie in with... Fine, questions. absolutely, carry on. Okay, thank you, Jim. Good morning, Lord Evans, mm -hmm. and thank you for appearing before us. Lord Evans, you... Uh, gave a, a summary of the way in which this country has moved over the last 20, 30 years, uh, particularly with the professions, to more independence. Um, I think most obviously in my own profession, uh, the Legal Services Act of 2007, following the Clemente reforms, and the detachment from the Law Society as a regulatory body with the creation of the SRA. Um, you mentioned the accountancy body. You talked about a separate regulator. You, took, you use the word credible um, by having this independence. But there's one glaring difference between all of the United Kingdom's regulatory bodies vis-a-vis -vis professions and this body. Do you know what that is? It's the democratic mandate that those people who sit in this body are uh, base their, their position on. Well, I wouldn't say it, it's that. If that if that's your evidence, that's fine. I would say it's the fact that all those bodies which you touched on are justiciable. The decisions of our current system are not justiciable. A member of parliament who's subject to a standard system does not have the ultimate recourse to a court of law and cannot challenge through cross-examination and evidence the ability to question the veracity of a decision. And so if you're arguing that we should move towards more independence, like the professions which have that ultimate safeguard, would you not be arguing that we need to have a system that is more court-like? What I was, uh, the, the, the question that I was answer, asking, sorry, the question that I was answering was why we believe that a greater independence is an appropriate direction of travel for uh, the oversight of the, the code of conduct. Uh, I, I don't, I wouldn't argue that the, the, there is a perfect similarity between the, the professions and MPs for a variety of reasons, including the one that I gave just now. Uh, but I think the expect, public expectations appear to be that there should be more independence in the oversight of the, uh, the activities of those in public life. And that's something which I, I think our committee would feel is, is a reasonable expectation. 
I think it is a matter for the, the parliamentary authorities how they respond to that uh, broad direction of travel. I can see why there is a um, reservation about going down a full uh, legal process with you know, people getting lawyered up and the whole thing ending up in the courts. There, that also does, e that does engage questions to do with uh, the, uh, the sovereignty of Parliament, uh, and I think that I, I, I would be surprised if there was great enthusiasm for that route uh, amongst parliamentarians. But uh, to take some of the aspects of that, i.e. a degree of independence, uh, and to ensure that that is applied does seem to me to be an attractive direction of travel. Thank you. Could I turn now to the question of the appeals themselves? In your letter to this committee, you suggested that MPs could be granted, as you termed it, formal rights of appeal. What do you mean by the word formal? You see, there is clearly a perception um, that the existing process is not as formal as it might be, and there were a number of claims during the period of the, um, the recent uh, case with uh, uh, Stephen Patterson. Could you give an example? Sorry to interrupt, but could you give an example of what you mean by that? Well, Mr Patterson himself and a number of the, uh, those who spoke in his uh, uh, defence suggested that the existing process did not provide a right of appeal. Uh, you may take a different view, and I'm not, of course, party to the exact way in which the procedures take place in this committee. Uh, if, there was an, if there was a belief on the part of the House that there needed to be greater independence, then I think that would be helped by having a more formal process which was clearly separate from the consideration by uh, other MPs, which uh, is, of course, a very important part of the work of this particular committee. And what do you mean by the phrase rights of appeal, specifically the word rights? How would you demonstrate that an individual has been given rights of appeal? Uh, I'm interested that you pick up on that word because it's not one that we gave great thought to. What we meant was that there would be a procedure whereby in the event that there, the, a particular individual believed that the initial investigation uh, and determination was something that they did not accept, that they had some way of challenging that uh, in, a, in a more visible way, perhaps, than is currently the case. Thank you. Um, does that include an appeal against, for example, sanctions? I think that's a matter for discussion by this committee. I don't feel that our committee necessarily has a strong position as to whether you should separate, as it were, the determination from the sanctions um, and I, can, I think you could make an argument in either direction, but I, um, I don't think we as a committee have considered that in any detail. Do you think formal rights of appeal were the House to go down that route would limit an MP's ability to refer the Commissioner's findings to this committee? Or could the formal rights of appeal be drawn wide enough to allow an MP, or a complainant for that matter, the right to refer to appeal on any issue that they consider relevant? Or you, I, 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 just to understand exactly what you're asking, are you suggesting that there would be, as it were, the, what we have termed the formal right of appeal, and then a parallel right of appeal to this committee? No, oh, I, think, I, think sorry, what, I, I think if I can help, I think what Alberta's meaning is that we... We think we've used often the term that um, a member has an effective right of an appeal. Once the commissioner has determined that there has been a, um, uh, a breach of the rules, um, the memorandum comes to the committee. And that, we have said, oftentimes, some people dispute whether this is formal enough, but they've said that is an effective right of an appeal. In, in effect, what happens is that we rehash the whole argument. We do the whole thing all over again, rather than what a, a court of appeal would normally do, which would, is have a set of grounds for appeal. appeal. So that I think Alberta is, is asking, is there a danger that if we were to go to a system of a more formalised system of appeal, you would only be able to appeal on strict legal criteria, 
um, and, if, and in effect, you would lo- the member might lose the right of being able to, you know, rehash the argument all over again. Is that right, Alberto? That's more or less. Indeed, with the caveat yeah. that it's not. It, it, would you agree? Given what uh, the chairman has just said, would you agree that it's not necessarily an either or with formal yeah. rights of appeal? That's yeah. the point I was trying to make. Forgive me if I was inelegant in my That's question. Fine. That's fine. Uh, I, I think. It, uh, that's not a, a, spe- a, a specific aspect that our committee has uh, considered, um, and it's one of the reasons why uh, we strongly support the existence of uh, bodies such as yours, which can tailor the application of broad principles to the exact circumstances of the institution. Uh, my instinct would be that you would probably w- want to question why, why you need completely to re assess a case from the start if you have an initial process which is thorough and uh, and has integrity. So, you know, I can understand why one might say, well, actually, we don't want to start arguing about the facts because those have already been established. But if you believe that there's been a misunderstanding or there has been a, you know, a misapplication of the rules, then by all means challenge it. But I okay. think that would be a matter for this committee. I've got one final question on this, Chairman, if, if I may mm-hmm. be indulged. Um, currently, the process that we have, which we'll loosely term an appeal, but I think we're agreed it's not a formal appeal in any sense mm-hmm. of that phrase. Currently, the process that we have is that the Parliamentary Commissioner, after investi- investigating a case, has a second role, which is adjudicating in first instance whether an MP has breached the code or not. If the MP has breached the code and the Commissioner deems it more serious end of the spectrum, it is referred to this committee. And the Commissioner then has a third role, which is presenter of the case to the committee, this body of 14 individuals. So there are three roles in that process for the Commissioner. But when this body is sitting as an appeal body on a disciplinary matter, the Commissioner, after having presented her case, and the MP after he or she has presented their case, the Commissioner is permitted back into the room to attend the deliberations of that appeal. Does that strike you as fair and in accordance with the principles of natural justice? I don't think I'm necessarily a person who would uh, be the first port of call on the, the technical question of the rights of, you know, the kind of principles of justice. And I think I would want to take legal advice on that because it's not an issue where I have a very clear kind of understanding of what the state of the um, state of the art is. What I would say is that in designing a system which is appropriate for the Commons, those are exactly the sort of elements that I believe that this committee should be taking into consideration. And I, but I, I don't think I would look to my committee to give advice on the exact details of that because I'm not sure that we are actually as close to the issues as you are and I'm not sure that we have a particular okay. expertise. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks, Alberto. Um, Mahmoud, we've got quite a lot of big issues still to do, so um, we, we may need to crack on a bit. Uh, Mahmoud. Good morning, Lord Evans. Um, do you think that there should be a new rule in the, con- in the code uh, prohibiting unreasonable and excessive personal attacks? I think that there is a strong case for doing that. It's, it's in the same area as the respect point. I also recognise that this is potentially contentious because of the question of free speech. But free speech has always been recognised as being a qualified right. We do not have this, the right to say absolutely anything we like uh, because there are other public goods out there. Uh, so I think if it is genuinely excessive and it is personalised, and in that sense, particularly as a, as a Member of Parliament, potentially an abuse of power, then I think that the Commons might well take the view that this is not something which is conducive to the, you know, the good running of the House. Thank you very much indeed. Bernard? Um, in the House of Lords, I understand that complaints have been made against uh, peers who have raised the question of whether trans men should be admitted to women's safe spaces, like uh, women's prisons. Um, and the complaints were made by members of the public. And then they were referred to um, the commissioner. The commissioner then 
made clear that she was not going to investigate these matters because, or he, I probably don't know if it's he or she, um, uh, because the, um, uh, the matter was raised by a member of the public and not raised by a member of the House. Now, if it had been a complaint raised by a member of the House, that matter of what a member said in the House would have been adjudicated not as evidence about some conflict of interest, but because of what that member said. Now, isn't that an infringement on the principle of Article 9? I appreciate it doesn't violate Article 9 because it's all an internal parliamentary process, but doesn't it infringe on the principle of Article 9 that if somebody wants to make the case for women's safe spaces in those terms, they should be free to do so? You mean in Parliament? In Parliament, yes. in, in a proceeding in Parliament? In a proceeding in Parliament, Because that's yes. an important distinction, isn't it, I think? Well, I think they should be allowed to do it anywhere, actually, but that's another right. matter. <laughs> but, I'd, yeah, Lord Evans. Uh, I, I'm not sure that this is a matter which falls within the remit of my committee. If you are asking my personal view, my personal view is that there should be considerable latitude for MPs and for peers to raise any matter of public policy and for that not to be seen as being a, an infringement because I think it's extremely important that even as it were heretical views if those are what they are uh, and I'm not making a judgment on any particular set of views should be admissible for discussion and it's a principle of a, you know a, a liberal democracy that you reach uh, a conclusion on the basis of competing views being articulated and some people will take one view and others will take another and then a conclusion will be led to. So it's extremely important in the functioning of a, a parliament of this sort that different views, even if some people find those views objectionable, should be aired. I think that's a different thing, incidentally, from personalised attacks on individuals. Right, well, that, I want to explore that a bit because... Um, I would draw a, a, a very sharp distinction between what happens in the chamber uh, or in a proceeding in Parliament, which is regulated by the Speaker um, or the Chair, where there are very clear rules on what you can and what you can't say, and you can't, you know, call another member a liar and, and, and all those kind of that. You can't call another person dishonourable and so on. But um, MPs are <coughs> endlessly calling one another dishonourable on Twitter um, or liars or idiots or whatever. Um, the, the question is whether there's a point at which an MP's engagement on Twitter or whatever, um, which is a direct, excessive, abusive, personal attack on another person, whether in a member or not, um, really needs to be investigated by the Commissioner. Uh, Report on local government did make a recommendation that anybody, any, any local government um, elected um, representative, that their activities on social media should, should be assumed to be part of their official duties unless otherwise demonstrated, because there has been very much the same sort of issues. And it is very detrimental to public life. I think we need to recognise that the, a culture of abuse and personal attack and threat actually is, deters people from engaging in public life, and that's very negative. And this applies particularly to people from you know, certain you know, categories. I mean, I think there's protected been a lot of... characteristics. Well, protected characteristics and possibly one or two others, but particularly uh, you know, w women, though some ethnic minorities, do seem to get more abuse than, uh, than you know, white males like me. And that's something which is highly detrimental to the sort of society we want to have. Andy, and then Albert. Thank you, Chair. You've almost asked my question again. Um, <laughs> I'm channeling my inner Andy. <laughs> um, I, I just, we, we've heard recently, Lord Evans, uh, about a, um, a situation where a, a member of Parliament was um, <clears throat> aggressively attacked on social media um, as a result of an opposition member making some comments. Um, and I'm just interested about what's unreasonable and excessive. Um, uh, one member of parliament making one comment can generate literally a million further comments on, uh, on social media. How do you propose that sort of an issue should be, be dealt with? I haven't got a detailed proposal on that. Uh, and I recognise, I think the threshold has to be set high because we don't want people to feel mm. nervous about making you know, legitimate but strongly held and controversial comments for the reasons that I've previously been discussing. Uh, and, you know, and whilst you shouldn't, by going into public life, 
have to accept, you know, physical threats and uh, abuse and so on. Nevertheless, you, you do need to have a pretty thick skin because, you know, that's the nature of democratic, you know, debate. So I think you have to set a high threshold, uh, but I don't have a sort of magic formula which enables us to exactly hit the right point. There will inevitably on this, as on a number of er other areas, be a matter of judgment. Thank you. Oh dear. Um, Alberto. <laughs> <laughs> Alberto. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I was elected seven years ago, uh, Lord Evans, and one of the first uh, constituency issues that came my way was to do with tumble dryers <laughs> and the fact that a company was alleged to have manufactured, designed tumble dryers that caused a safety hazard, indeed fires, and it was a Labour MP uh, and I that worked together on this. My concern with this suggestion is the chairman said, used the word person, but person in law can mean a natural person, which is, I think, what the chairman uh, intended when he used the word person, but a legal person as well. And a legal person, business in this case, uh, in the example I'm citing, um, I had to campaign vigorously um, in respect of the chief executive of this company that was perhaps hard of hearing when it came to this very real problem that affected millions of households across the United Kingdom. My concern is that if this recommendation was to go through, can you at least see the risk that there could be less desirable individuals in society who have committed wrong and the MPs might be accused of making unreasonable and excessive personal attacks by virtue of campaigning on a particular issue, such as the one that I've cited? Um, I have to declare an interest because I think I had one of those tumble dryers. Um, <laughs> but uh, moving on from that, the, 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 I don't think we... The, I, I don't think the, uh, the thought that this might mean a legal person rather than a, a natural person um, was probably what was behind the thought, although obviously others will have a different view, and it does underline why it is always a good idea when you're making rules to get them lawyered to make sure you haven't said something accidental, so I yes. entirely understand that. Um, as long as you don't ask two lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> so I... A specialist lawyer, I think, is what you have in mind. <laughs> Lord Evans, a specialist lawyer. Anyway, the, more, yep. the more the merrier, as far as I'm concerned. Here, here. Uh, so <laughs> I, I accept that, and you know, uh, uh, it's, a reasonable, it's a reasonable question, but perhaps one where I'm not the best person to uh, answer it. What I do believe is... I think you've given me the answer I was looking for, Lord, Lord okay. Well, actually, yeah. actually, I'm going to interfere, because you, it, it was interesting, Albert, you used a... Um, I think you were being metaphorical when you said that he was hard of hearing. Yes. Now, if you were to attack the person on the basis of being deaf, that is one thing. That would be a personal and could be an excessive and abusive campaign, which could be investigatable, I would have thought, because that is an attempt to bully a person. Whereas, um, you know, suggesting that the person is not really listening to what's going on and, and so on, I would have thought that, that was um, perfectly legitimate. Is, is there not a distinction that is achievable here? Yeah, I, I think... Being very critical of a, a, a businessman whose company is not doing the right thing by the public seems to me to be very different from a personal attack on that individual as a human being. OK. Um, we need to move on a bit. Paul. Yes. Thanks, Albert. Good morning, Lord Evans. Um, morning. As you know, this committee has proposed a number of changes to the lobbying rules, and they include extending uh, the time period of 12 months, clarifying the serious wrong exemption and requiring MPs to have a written contract that excludes lobbying. Do you agree with those uh, proposed changes? And do you think we should have different rules for those participating uh, in proceedings and those initiating proceedings? I, my view, and I think the view of the committee, was that the proceed, those recommendations struck us as sounding sensible. Um, we recognise that there is a slight complexity around you know, one or two of them, uh, but that the broad direction of travel strike, struck us as being uh, sensible. I think the, the question as to whether if, if, somebody's, if somebody is maintaining their registration as a nurse, um, 
because they you know, may need to go back to it at a later stage, whether you then have to get the NHS Trust to write a contract that says that the, she, that the individual, he or she, won't be lobbying on behalf of that trust strikes me as perhaps going beyond, but particularly where you're talking about a commercial contract, building it in would seem to me to be very sensible. And, and the, the second part is there's a difference between lobbying to initiate a yeah. proceeding and then those actually in a proceeding. I mean, do you think there should be some sort of separate rules for those? I can't quite see what the great distinction there is, personally. I mean, in other environments, if, you, if your interest suddenly became engaged in the middle of a conversation, you would you know, at least alert and probably recuse yourself and say, look, I probably shouldn't take part in this because I'm actually a shareholder in X. Um, so I think you know, that seems to me to be uh, an entirely well, reasonable yeah, process. Yeah. I'm proud that doesn't happen. But, no. uh, yeah, thank you no. very much. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much. Um, can I ask you about reasonable limits? Yep. Um, you've seen what we've said on this issue, and, the, um, and one of our difficulties, or one of our anxieties, has been about how you, how one could possibly um, police, monitor, um, uh, or set what a reasonable limit would be. Do you just want to lay out your stall? Yep. We discussed this at length in the committee recently. Uh, and it was one of those conversations where the presence of active politicians, uh, elected politicians, was actually extremely helpful in, in making it clear how jolly difficult this is. Uh, because, you know, administratively, it would obviously be very convenient to say either you're not going to have any external employment or to say you can do 10 hours and you can earn £20,000, but anything more than that's a breach. Uh, and I can see that functionally, you know, practically, that would be a very attractive way of doing it. In reality, I think it would raise all sorts of exceptions and complications which um, you know, a lay person, as it were, or a sort of, you know, a, a, an interested but independent observer might think, well, not quite sure whether they've done something wrong there. Um, we are looking at this only from the point of view of standards, so we are not looking at this, uh, I mean, this is quite a multifaceted issue because it's to do with the relationship between uh, MPs and their constituents and it's to do with, you know, reputation of the House and all those sort of things where we don't have any particular locus. Our, our conclusion on this was that, and the, the committee has previously said that we think that uh, a reasonable uh, level of this is acceptable. Um, we continue to believe that, but we think that, uh, and recognising the practical problems of policing that, that there may be ways of trying to outline where reasonable, where the boundary of reasonable is. And in particular, you know, we, we suggest, it's not a hard recommendation, but we would suggest that it's worth considering whether, for instance, continuing professional qualification requirements, if you have to do X hours a year in order to maintain your qualification, uh, that, that might be treated differently. Se secondly, that the, uh, the number of roles that MPs as you know, public figures and as politicians might be in involved in, in terms of you know, public speaking and journalism and so on, again, might be seen as being really a, a, an extension of the, their MP's role rather than in conflict with it, and that might therefore be treated differently. And, it, and we, we suggest that possibly having a rebuttable assumption that um, beyond a certain amount of money or beyond a certain number of hours, it is likely to be a judge to be unreasonable, might be helpful not just to... Uh, those adjudicating, but also to MPs themselves, so that it gives a signal to say, look, you know, if, if you are making 15,000 a year, then it is highly unlikely that this will be judged to be unreasonable. If you are making a you know, million pounds a year, then that looks unreasonable on the face of it, and you're going to have to have extremely strong case as to why, in your particular circumstances, it is not unreasonable to be earning a million pounds a year from external interests because most people would view that as unreasonable. So it's a pretty clear indication as to where the boundary might lie, but accepting that there may be special cases which uh, you would have then have to defend. There might be lots of MPs um, who are earning a million pounds a year from their... Um, property interests. Property interests, um, their uh, shared portfolio. Um, how are we going to deal with that? Well, I think in a way that's a slightly different issue because it's not a standards issue as to whether you happen to have personal wealth unless there is a conflict of interest. 
so I think the, from our point of view, the issue is whether there is a conflict of interest or a, a breach of what one might call the sort of selflessness thing. Are you actually diligently undertaking your work in support of your constituents or are you spending most of your effort uh, working for somebody else? Uh, and I think that is a standards issue. And I think the issue of conflicts of interest is a standards issue, which is why, uh, to jump ahead, I suspect, in your questioning, <laughs> we very much support greater transparency of other interests beyond paid interests, and, uh, and because we believe that uh, then you are relying on the, the judgment of, MP, uh, of constituents as to whether this is something they believe to be acceptable, but it's really important that it's visible. I'm completely with you on conflict of interest. Uh, that, it seems to me, is the absolute key, um, the nub of any of these issues. Um, uh, and maybe we need to find ways of making that more transparent and obvious. Um, my anxiety is, if we, for instance, were to say 10 hours a week is fine, I think there would be lots of people who would say, well, why is 10 hours fine? Um, why shouldn't it be 20? Or why shouldn't it be 2? Um, so I wonder whether that's just creating a rod for our own back, where actually really the, the issue is the, is, the, is the conflict of interest. I think there is, a, and this is one where you know, the, your judgment is probably at least as important, well, at least as well informed as the, the judgment of our committee as to whether there is a public um, confidence issue that, and if somebody is doing, you know, 40 hours a week working for uh, Mega Bank Limited or whatever it is, uh, then or PLC, then you know, are they actually doing their job uh, in a way which would, one would expect of a public servant? Um, I also absolutely, and we discussed some of this in the committee. You know, what would be a sensible limit? Well, you know, kind of, it's jolly difficult, uh, yeah. but. The fact that it's jolly difficult may not, which is part of the reason we, we don't think it would be sensible to say, you can do 20 hours and that's it. You know, 19 hours, 59 minutes, good. You know, 20 hours and one minute, bad. And but just somebody on, has to, if you're going to have that sort of thing, you've got to have some indication, which is why we like the rebuttable assumption idea. And then my other question is just about diligence, because um, my constituency is completely different from, well, as far as I can see, anybody else's constituency. But, um, it, you know, and, and I... And I I think of myself as a very diligent MP. Others might not think I'm diligent because I don't do the things that they do, um, but it may be that they don't have any former miners in their constituency. And, um, or, I mean, a mine is a bit... It, it's, it's differently constructed. And I just wonder how you could have a committee, or for that matter, the commissioner, because in the end this is about the rules of the House, investigating whether an MP had been diligent enough. That's at the nub of your point, isn't it? I don't think that diligence, I mean, diligence is not a Nolan principle, uh, <laughs> although some people have suggested perhaps it's just as important to the public and probably is, actually. Um, but, I, I mean, this is, this is why we, we are continue to be attracted to the concept of reasonableness, but we also recognise that reasonableness does leave a very serious sort of onus on the commissioner in deciding where that is. And part of the reason for suggesting that there might be some areas of carve out and also some broad indica some indications as to where the boundary of reasonableness is likely to be set might uh, give signals both to MPs themselves in the decisions that they make and also some starting point for the Commissioner. OK. I've got several people who want to ask about this. So, Andy, I think. Yep. No? OK. Uh, Jane, then. And then Bernard, so, and then Alberto. Um, interested in this in this concept around reasonable limits but in the context of an MP uh, there is not an MP job description and there are so many things that can impact how an MP chooses to, to undertake their role so it's you know the makeup of their constituency as, as the chair has indicated but also it's about uh, uh, you know their um, how many votes they had and how close it is and the, and the makeup of their local authority it's about what their in, where their interests lie so there is there is so much that impacts um, how an mp will spend their time that actually i think it is really really difficult to to set um, a reasonable limit because you have got so many different influences that would determine how an MP might spend its, his, his or her time. And I think the other thing that, um, so I'd be interested in your thought on that, but the other thing is, is 
you know, public confidence, to my mind, is built by clarity and transparency. Um, and I'm not sure that within a, in a system in the context of Parliament, you can have real clarity and determination because so much of it has to be based on judgment. And judgment means you'll have some people who agree with you and some people who don't um, agree with you. So as soon as you start talking about reasonable limits, you put in a parameter that is really, really hard, A, to administer, and B, to really make a reasonable judgment about that's going to have anything to do with public confidence. I think the public confidence is far more about the financial, you know, it's, it's and, you know, the, the historical element of MPs being wealthy people. And all they're doing is just putting more money into their coffers because they're an MP and not actually to do with the content of how they do their role. Um, well, I, I agree with you that it's extremely difficult. I think the transparency one, you probably, it is slightly easier to, as it were, require. Um, if, if one accepts that there is no absolute independent way of establishing what is the right limit, there is a question then as to whether you want to give an indicative limit uh, or whether you just say, well, you know, up to the MPs and constituents whether they'll continue to elect them. And that's a you know, judgment you that can be made. It's obviously not a judgment for my committee. But uh, our suggestion was that some, as it were, you know, not a bright line that says, look, 10 hours good, 10 and a half hours bad, but at least, you know, if you go over 10, then you're going to be likely to be questioned pretty hard, uh, or 20 or 40 or whatever it is, uh, as a, uh, about, where the, uh, about whether this is reasonable in your circumstances. But I absolutely understand that uh, suggesting that the commissioner should be the sort of, um, you know, do an annual appraisal on P MPs to make sure that they're working hard enough and could do better. Uh, is not the role and would be completely invidious and, you know, harmful. Bernard, and then Alberta, and then we've got a couple of questions to finish off. I would contest um, the fact, that your assertion, that it's just up to the constituents. Um, because if you're to survive as a member of parliament in one of the major parties, you do have to maintain a relationship with your whips and your colleagues. You have to maintain a relationship with your local party um, mm. and uh, your national party has to want you to continue to serve as a candidate at the next election. So I have known, um, I mean, we all know, we have all known uh, MPs who really take the mick, uh, but they know how to game the rules. They know how to game your rules. Um, um, but they get deselected or they get cold-shouldered out. Um, maybe that should happen a bit more and national parties should be more vigilant. But can I just ask, is your principle that, some, that an occupation that would take somebody away from Parliament for a number of weeks, um, that would be over the limit? I think our, our, our suggestion is that if the, given the complexity of this, given that this, you know, that reasonable is, you know, is a defensible position but not necessarily a terribly helpful position, that some indication as to what reasonable, how reasonable should be interpreted, is likely to be interpreted as helpful. Well, give, give if, your if your job reasonable. does take you away from your role in, you know, not in recess, but at other times for weeks at a time, then I think it certainly raises a question as to whether you are putting the interests of your constituents first or whether you are putting your personal uh, financial interests first. Because well, I mean, there aren't many jobs I, I, I just give you an example, one or two weeks. examples. <coughs> Jury service could take a member of parliament out of parliament for months. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's not remunerated. But that doesn't serve that doesn't serve the interests of his constituents uh, directly or her constituents directly. It does, um, a it, does serve, it does serve the public interest. Yes, yes I appreciate that. But that, that's that's a very good test. Does it serve the public interest? Um, a reservist who is called off for six month tour of duty in some foreign land. Um, but then somebody who's absenting themselves for. Um, from every debate, not taking part in questions, not contributing to a committee, just turning up to the minimum number of votes to keep the whips happy, but he's writing a book. How do you, how do you, how do you catch that? Yep. I completely agree with you. There um, is a high degree of Or self-building a house. Or self-building a house. Yep. Um, or very keen on golf. Now, uh, if you've got... Um, running a farm. <laughs> if you've got a, a doctor who continues a private practice, or a, 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 an NHS practice, um, uh, but who is taken out of uh, Parliament 
for a number of things. Most people would regard that as a good thing. Um, but that might create absences which would disadvantage his or her constituents. Um, and, of course, the famous case of a barrister, who we shall not name, um, um, who probably earns very large sums of money and is taken away from Parliament for extensive cases. Is it in the public interest that that person should just leave public life? You, uh, it, it, you make my case for me, which is that these are issues where there is a great deal of judgment. Uh, How much of an exodus should we be prepared to countenance of older and more experienced members of Parliament, people who perhaps had the political careers, um, and who are now continuing to contribute their knowledge and experience to Parliament, but are private members, and therefore um, exercising their discretion to um, um, mm. enjoy outside interests and to earn money outside, but, but who would otherwise leave Parliament? I take that as a, a rhetorical rather than actual mm. question for you. I'm, I'm afraid so. <laughs> it is, Bernard. Sorry, I've got Alberto, and then we've still got one big chunk that we've got to do. I'll be very quick, uh, Chairman. Thank cool. you. Um, my issue with this phrase, reasonable limits, is both in principle and in practice. Um, Lord Evans, uh, you'll probably be familiar, although MPs are not employees, you'll be familiar that the employment law of the three jurisdictions of the UK does not prohibit second or tertiary employment for individuals. You can work in a supermarket and you can sell things on eBay. You can work in a supermarket in a forecourt of a petrol station. You can, like yourself, be a member of the legislature, uh, chair of the Committee on Standards in Public Life, and as we're told here in your bio, director of ARC Data Services, you're a member of the Public Interest Committee of KPMG, and you hold a number of other private sector boards. You're an extremely busy individual, aren't you? And surely um, all of these roles that you do, they're not just through philanthropy. They're, they're a means of earning some extra income for yourself. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Right. Not all of them. Um, so I, I think given that employment law in this country does not prohibit second or tertiary roles of employment for individuals, why are you suggesting that MPs should, in principle, be restricted from secondary or tertiary means of income? Well, I'm not, and, I'm not, and the com our committee is not suggesting and has not said that we believe that MPs should be forbidden from having any extra interests. We are saying, in terms of um, pub uh, the, uh, the uh, conflict of interest, that it needs to be absolutely transparent as to what those interests are, and that there may be some categories of interest which would be in conflict with their, um, their principal role. And I think the, the, the recommendation of uh, you know, parliamentary strategists not being an appropriate role to combine is an example of that. And we are also saying that uh, there is a reasonable expectation on a, a, a public servant who is uh, paid a salary on a full-time basis that they, that should be their principal activity on behalf of the people who have elected them. So I'm not in any sense suggesting that I or the committee have recommended that others that other roles should not be allowed, but we believe, I think it would be difficult to argue that those should not be reasonable, to, argue, to make the argument that we should allow unreasonable levels of uh, external interests would be quite hard to make. So we believe it should be a reasonable level, and we've been trying to be helpful to the committee in suggesting ways in which that might be interpreted in order to make it a more pra practical proposition uh, for the um, adjudication of that rule. I ask that deliberatively un in the knowledge that you've clearly said reasonable limits. The reason I ask that is it's helpful to have on record what you've just said, because I think the perception out there is that this is the final step to prohibit second or tertiary rules, that the next step is a reasonable limit and then the ultimate uh, banning on, on such activity. But in practice, and I think as we've heard from others around this table that have quite, in practice, do you not accept that it would be virtually impossible to have a fair definition of what is meant by reasonable limits and it would place the adjudicator, in this case the commissioner, in a deeply unenviable position to attempt to even define what is meant by reasonable limits. Well, I think that's why your committee posed the question to us as to what our view was on this matter. And what we have done is to consider it at some length in a conversation that was not wholly dissimilar to this conversation, <laughs> uh, and then to try to come back with as helpful a proposal as we could, yes. uh, which is what we have done. 
Thank you, Lord. <laughs> just a quick thing on this from me. Uh, just a thought. Um, we've, we've obviously made a recommendation, which is following on your recommendation from 2018, that you shouldn't be able to take on consultancy roles which, and strategy roles, which um, you know, are effectively a sort of semi-lobbying roles or providing advice on how others might lobby. I just have a question, which if you're a board member of a company and you're a member of either the Lords or the Commons, at the board they will ask, won't they, for advice on how to deal with Parliament? I mean, it's just a fact. No, that's one of the reasons you've been one would have been appointed. So is, is it really a, a real distinction that we're drawing here? I mean, my own experience, I've never been asked that. Funnily enough, um, usually because you know, most companies have got a public affairs department who do this all the time, mm. um, and then, then you get into the whole question of lobbying uh, and the, uh, the the ways in which that should be regulated. And, and obviously, we have taken a view in our committee in previously as uh, as to where the appropriate limits would be for lobbying, uh, and we continue to take an interest in that and have made recommendations in our most recent report on it. Um, and, and you know. I guess that in these areas, you are never going to get perfection through regulation because you're always going, to, you know, as Mr. Jenkins said, you will always get those who play the system, etc. But we need to be as clear and as, uh, and as, uh, as simple as we can given the complexity of the, re of the situation. And you know, the, this is a very complex and difficult issue, and it does not lend itself to simplistic answers. And just on the back of that, the, the contract point that we've made would obviously clear that up in many of those relationships. You know, where you had a contract which said, I'm, you're not allowed to ask me to provide advice on the following things. But you can't do that with a board member, can you? Because a board member is a, has a fiduciary responsibility. Yeah, and I think, I guess that, uh, you know, the transparency helps on that, but I can see the, the direction of your consideration. It depends partly on the sort of company as well, yeah. and how many companies actually are dependent day to day on parliamentary decisions. Um, you know, obviously Parliament sets a context for business to take place. But I think the question of actual contract-related lobbying is much more likely to come into play than big issues of, uh, of legislative strategy in most boards. And uh, I'm not asking you to comment on an individual case at all in what I'm about to ask you about, but um, back in 1981, Lord Campbell Savers, uh, now Lord Campbell Savers, then Dale Campbell Savers, made an allegation about Ian McGregor, who was then running a government-run business uh, um, in industry, steel, uh, which was that he had um, said that he wouldn't spend, that no um, assistance would be given to steel workers in his constituency because he had raised certain things in the House of Commons, and he thought that this was inappropriate. <coughs> it went to a privileges. Um, committee. Uh, it was all rather inconclusive in the end, but there was a big row about it. Just wonder what you think about this issue of um, either inducements or threats made by one MP to another MP to persuade MPs to vote in a particular direction. Do you think we need to have a rule on that? I think it's very important to safeguard the ability of individual MPs to use their judgment subject to you know, the normal party constraints on uh, the decisions that are facing them. And I think if they feel that they're being, there is undue pressure being placed on them by another MP, then that would be a matter of concern. Is, is removing, is saying, you will get a school or you won't get a school, you will get a hospital, you won't get a hospital, you will get a bypass, you won't get a bypass, is that undue pressure? I'd want to take advice on that because I, it's not an issue. I mean, I am aware that it's a current play issue, of course, in terms of the discussions around whipping arrangements. Um, it's not an issue which my committee has discussed in those terms. I, I'd want to take. No, I want to take. Um, you know, I'd want to give it due consideration, given the significance of it in the current climate. Got Rita first. Sorry, okay. but Rita. I just want to follow up. That well, I think point. that's what Rita's doing. Okay. Well, I, 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 it was the point before yours, actually. I just wanted to stay on the reasonable limits point. Um, um, so I, but my own position has been, I think it's too difficult to prescribe by reference to limits. Um, and, and I think you've 
you, you're broadly sympathetic to that. Um, but strangely, the discussion that we're having with you has driven me closer to the position of thinking, well, OK, if it's not possible to um, articulate uh, uh, a sensible framework which allows for discretion, we'll just have a rule. Uh, and, the rule and the only rule that could be is MPs should not be permitted to undertake any form of secondary employment. And although Alberto is doubtless right about the legislative position, uh, many employers do have rules about um, the uh, ability um, for their employees to take on secondary employment. So I've worked in the fire service and certainly firefighters have to seek consent for very good reasons, a range of very good reasons to... Um, to be able to undertake secondary employment. Um, but but I'm, I'm now kind of leaning closer than I ever have been to the idea that if, if we can't work with uncertainty or reasonableness or your more elegant uh, new turn of phrase... Um, uh, rebuttable presumption. Rebuttable presumption, <laughs> yes. I, I have to say it amused me a bit. I was trying to imagine how most people would understand that concept. Um, if it's not possible to arrive at something uh, that everybody accepts and understands, then actually the better default position might be no secondary employment. D has your committee contemplated that? And, and, the, and, and there's a case that can be made for it, which is Rita, both a respectable case. Sorry, I'm really sorry, but yeah. we're very, very late for the next witnesses, and we it's are. partly my fault. Um, the committee in its 2018 report uh, considered these things in some, at some length uh, and, you know, with conversations which I wasn't on the committee at that time, but, it, but I suspect were quite similar to the conversation that's just taken place, uh, and came to the conclusion that the best it could say was reasonable. We've had a similar, you know, revisiting of that and said, well, do we think this is still the right answer? We still think it is the right answer. We accept that in practical terms that that poses real problems, which is why we suggested a couple of carve-outs and a couple of sort of as it were, indicative sets of rules. Um, the rebuttable consumption idea, you know, comply or explain, is, is a regulatory you know, construct that is you know, used elsewhere. Um, we, we are not of the view that there needs, from a standards point of view, to be an absolute bar. There are, of course, a lot of issues to do with this which are go beyond, as it were, classic standards questions, uh, which is uh, you know, beyond the remit of my committee. But from our perspective, the approach that we take would seem to us to meet the standards requirement and go some way towards clarifying what reasonable might look like. Grant. Bernard. A very brief and point. Andy. Uh, two very brief points. One is, um, what is the effect of increasing official frowning on members' outside interests if we don't, in the end, actually ban it? Isn't the public always going to be led to the expectation that one day this will be banned because the rules are getting tighter and tighter? <coughs> yes. Or should the Committee on Standards of Public Life and this committee actually say, no, outside interests are a good thing and they can only be regulated up to a certain point, but that's okay. it. Aren't we just leading to an expectation where we're making our life more and more difficult because we can't ban outside interests? I'm not sure it's our committee's job to say whether it's a good idea or not to have those interests because there are all sorts of arguments in favour of those and against it which go beyond standards issues. Where we look at this is in terms of ensuring that individual MPs are clearly acting in the public good and giving their main uh, kind of effort towards their public responsibilities and that they are not conflicted. I live with that. Okay. <coughs> yep. um, and on the question of ministers threatening withdrawal of bypasses or schools, isn't that a matter for the ministerial code? Isn't that possibly a misuse of public funds in a positive or negative way? Um, and it isn't it a, possibly even a matter of indirect bribery, but it's not a matter for the regulation of the House of Commons or the Commons Code. It's a matter for the ministerial code. That's not an issue that my committee has looked at and considered, so I don't think I have a great locus in commenting on your uh, observation. Could I ask you to write to us about that? Because yep. I, I'm, a, I'm aware you, 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 you seem a bit blindsided by it, so I'm, I apologise, but uh, it will be helpful, I think, if you were to have a thought about it. Okay. Now, we've got one final area, which we still have to cover, and I'm terribly sorry that we're t keeping so much of your time. Um, Mr Carter. Thank you. I'll, I'll 
try and keep this relatively short, actually. Um, we know there's a difference between the way that um, members of parliament uh, who are ministers record benefits received and those that are not ministers. Um, do we not need to have a system where uh, all members of parliament register benefits uh, in one place uh, for everything they receive? Our, our view is that we wouldn't want to let the government off the hook on this, and we actually think it's the responsibility of government to make the appropriate transparency um, uh, data available uh, for those who are transacting government business, which is to say ministers. And in our most recent report and previously, we have said that we don't think that that is being done appropriately. We think it's not being done more frequently enough, and we don't think the government is complying with its own undertakings in this area. And our focus is on uh, encouraging and recommending that the government does appropriate declarations of, uh, of these things on a timely basis and in accordance with the, thing, the undertakings it's, it has itself given. And we think there's a compliance failure here. Can I just press you, what do you think is a timely manner? Well, we are now, we, we note that even the, I think it's sort of half yearly, isn't being kept up. We, we think it should be done on a monthly basis. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Just one thing, if you could clarify for me on that then. So, as things stand, um, and I'm not asking you, that, that nothing's been done wrong here, as far as I understand it, but the Prime Minister is required to register his holiday, with, which was paid for by Lord Goldsmith, um, in the ministerial um, register, but his stay in the VIP suite at Heathrow with the Commons register. Doesn't that just make it all seem a bit bonkers? Sounds bonkers. <laughs> right, there we are. I think we'll end with that yeah, then. So, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, thank you very much. You've got, you've got your news release head. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to suspend for a couple of minutes just um, so that the next witnesses come in. And uh, if anybody wants to have a comfort break, then that might be necessary. Lord Evans, thank you very much for your time. And uh, thank you very much for the work that your committee does. We're very, very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Order, order.